We're really pleased to welcome you all to what is the inaugural Adapting to Climate Change Wyoming in Wyoming Small Grants Competition. It's funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration through Western Water Assessment, which is an organization that several of us are affiliated with, and we'll tell you more about it in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to just take a moment and introduce our project team from Western Water Assessment. So Benay Duncan is on, if you can share your screen for a second, who's our managing and interim director. Um, there's Benay and Katie Clifford, who is our lead um, social scientist. And we also have Ethan Knight, who's our associate scientist um, with Western Water Assessment. And my name is Corey Knapp. I'm an assistant professor in the Hobbs School of Environment and Natural Resources here at the University of Wyoming. And I'm also a co-PI on this grant. And before we continue on, I just wanna let you all know that we are recording this webinar and we'll share the recording at our website for those who were not able to attend. And with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Ethan who's gonna tell you all a bit more about Western Water Assessment. All right, thank you, Corey. Well, as you said, um, my name is Ethan Knight and I work with Western Water Assessment. Um, and I just wanted to share a bit about Western Water Assessment for those of you who haven't worked with us in the past. Um, Western Water Assessment is an applied research program that produces usable science to help address uh, real world climate problems. We are based at the University of Colorado Boulder, the University of Utah, and the University of Wyoming. And we work in the Intermountain West, specifically Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Western Water Assessment is one of 12 teams in the NOAA Climate Adaptation Partnerships, or CAP program, formerly known as the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments, or RESA program. Um, at Western Water Assessment, we are working to build resiliency in water systems and communities in our region, while working on many climate-related issues, ranging from water resource management and drought to climate adaptation and resilience to compound hazards. Western Water Assessment differs from a traditional research program because our goal is to produce usable science that helps address real world problems by directly working with communities, resource managers, nonprofits, and other partners to tailor our work to their needs or priorities. This sometimes takes shape as original research and other times involves research integration, including those uh, things like workshops, webinars, online tools and resources, or technical reports like climate summaries and assessments. Other times it involves providing expertise or presenting at a community or partner meeting. As you'll see in the funding announcement packet, each funding recipient will be expected to work with the Western Water Assessment team on their project. This is at no cost to the funding recipient. We can connect across a number of activities listed in the service areas portion of the information packet. This slide lists the categories of services we can provide, including climate information synthesis and tools, vulnerability and adaptation exploration, connecting with partners and more. And uh, I will turn it back to Corey now to share more about the funding opportunity. All right, thank you so much, Ethan. And I wanna start off um, just for a moment, setting our context, why this grant program, why at this time? Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about how I got excited and interested in climate change. And I really started my career in adaptation because of the observations that I was hearing from ranchers and other land-based livelihoods across the Intermountain West. So I was hearing things about decreases in water availability, shifts in timing of water, and increased drought. And these things really were impacting the way that people could manage their landscapes and drove me to be really interested in how we can actually respond to these types of events. And anyone living in Wyoming during the past um, few years has really observed an increase in extreme weather and climate related events. So on the screen, I'm just sharing with you a few that um, I think were very impactful. Um, the Mullen fire in 2020 that happened here near Laramie, the Yellowstone flooding that happened last year in the park that they're still sort of rebuilding and, and dealing with the aftermath of that. And then um, drought that happened over 2020 and 2021. And um, just from observations and conversations with landowners, just the increased intensity and duration of those droughts is really impactful. And so these events are really impacting rural and indigenous communities across the state. They have direct and indirect impacts on communities, which can be really extenuated 
by natural resource dependence or else pre-existing vulnerabilities such as limited or insufficient housing, historical marginalization, or low paying jobs. And so when we're talking about adaptation to climate change, we wanna keep all of these factors in mind and, and really think about how climate change is impacting specific communities and what we can do to respond to those things. Next slide. All right, so this is the first time that Western Water Assessment has applied to the small grant supplement that's provided through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And it's the very first time that we're offering this form of a grant, although we hope that there are many more in the future. And this year we can fund three to four community projects with up to $30,000 each. So you can ask for less than that, um, but we have a limit of 30,000. Next slide. So we have four primary goals of this program. And I really would encourage you all when you're thinking about um, responding to this RFP to really think about each of these goals and how you're meeting these goals when designing your proposal. So the first thing is we really want to build resilience or the ability to be prepared, withstand, and emerge stronger from the types of shocks and stressors that we're seeing in the system. A second thing that we want to do is we want to use these projects as case studies or inspiration for other communities. Um, this work has not been done widely um, in this region, and we'd really love to use these as demonstration projects that can inspire or share solutions with other communities. Third, we want to really connect with community level projects and build relationships by sharing the skills and resources that might last beyond the project. So for instance, um, you'll notice Ethan talked about some of the skills and resources that Western Water Assessment can bring to your projects, um, but we'd really love for you to leverage those. And we'd also love to develop relationships um, with community stakeholders who are interested in working on projects that, that might last beyond the duration of this specific grant opportunity. And then the last thing is we wanna make sure that these meet locally defined and relevant needs. So when you're writing your proposal, we really want to see evidence that there's support for and a need for this project in your community. So if there are ways that you can demonstrate the fact that this is needed, that it's supported by other community members, that will go a long way. Next slide. So I wanted to provide some suggestions of potential activities that might be funded through this grant. So these are here as inspiration. Um, a sharing of potential approaches, but I want folks to realize that, that the projects that you can propose are definitely not limited to this set of um, ideas. So we've got things like understanding perceptions of climate change and risk, community outreach and engagement, assessing existing vulnerabilities, funding really applied on ground adaptation projects, addressing what we might consider baseline vulnerabilities, um, things that make people more um, sensitive to climate change impacts and stressors, or thinking about extending existing programs to serve rural and underserved communities. Um, so those are just some ideas and, and we can talk more about your ideas during question and answer period. Um, next slide, please. So we're looking for applications from a wide range of uh, organizations who are working with rural underserved or tribal communities. So um, community groups are eligible, local state and tribal governments, nonprofit organizations, or else private entities. So there's a wide range of um, types of groups that are eligible for this. And we, because this is the first time that we're offering it, we would really like to see a diversity of groups that are applying for this funding. Next slide. All right, so key deadlines. Right now we are having the webinar. We will post this webinar online for folks that were not able to attend. Um, May 1st, so proposals will be due March 31st. So by the end of this month, the proposals are fairly short. Um, we're asking for a cover page and then um, limited to a five page narrative with a budget and a budget justification that are separate from those five pages. Uh, and so it's not, a incredibly 
intensive or, or a long um, grant application. We are hoping, well, we will plan to make those funding decisions by May 1st. So we'll have a really tight turnaround um, in letting you know if you're funded. And then there's a little bit of a delay um, till funding can be dispersed. And part of this is dependent on how quickly we get the needed documentation um, to our grants program office in order to get the funding out to you. And the duration of the projects can be up to two years. So they don't have to last two years, but they have to be completed by July of 2025. Next slide. So how do we do this? Um, and this is a very important slide because it is giving you information both about the requirements of the grant and then the criteria of how the panel will select the final recipients. And so the way that we've set this competition up is that we have a panel of judges that include two people from Western Water Assessment, two people from the University of Wyoming, one statewide representative, one tribal representative, and one representative from the agricultural community. And so we've got a nice diversity of folks on this panel. And what we'll do first is we'll use these requirements as a way of making sure that you're eligible to get the funding. So these four first things are things that you need to make sure that, that you fit within um, and that you follow to be included and, um, and, uh, and judged in terms of the criteria. So the first one is just that you um, follow the guidelines of the request for proposals. So this is things like page length and type and the size of the font and the types of information that we're looking for. So I would encourage everyone to read those RFP requirements well and make sure that you're following the guidance that we give you. So that will be the first thing that we're looking for then we want all proposals to either address adaptation or resilience building. Um, third, all of these grants have to focus on communities in Wyoming. So this um, funding source is really set up to support communities in Wyoming. Um, and so make sure that you have a state, um, a focus within the state. And then you need to be either working with rural or indigenous communities. And so a project that was um, you know, solely focused on um, one of our more urban centers would probably not be a great fit for this specific grant proposal. And then the criteria that we'll be ranking you on um, is whether your project is feasible and likely to succeed. Is it something that is feasible in terms of time frame, in terms of the funding that you're asking for? So be careful when you're thinking about what you can actually accomplish with the funding. You can request up to $30,000, but as we all know, that is, is a fair bit of money, but it does go quickly and you wanna make sure that you're actually asking for all the things that you need to be able to do the work that you're proposing to do. Um, you also need to be focusing on some sort of response to climate change. Um, you have to have a plan for working with Western Water Assessment. And as Ethan said earlier, we have, you know, many resources, many um, activities that Western Water Assessment does that we are willing to partner with you on and, and do free of charge for you. Um, and we'll also be looking at the novelty and innovation of your projects. And so those are requirements and criteria. If you don't meet the requirements, um, you will not be judged on those criteria. So make sure that you're following those four, criteria, those four requirements. Um, and then you will be, you know, in running for funding for this grant proposal. All right, next slide. All right, and I want to give you a little bit of the nuts and bolts about the program. And uh, this is important and not um, necessarily a challenging thing to do, but it's something good to know from the onset that you will need to do this. Every applicant must be registered in the SAM system, which is the system for award management and have a unique identity um, identifier. On our website, we have the link to this system. Um, it's very easy. Both of them are free and easy to establish, but they will be required in the application materials. Um, we're asking for you to put this in your um, cover, cover letter. And so um, please make sure if you don't have 
a UEI right now um, to register and, and get yourself one of those so that you're um, able to be in the grant competition. There's also an option and we have um, this e example financial documentation both on our website and through the info ready system. You can submit that when you submit your proposal. It is not necessary to do that. Um, but including it in your application would speed up the dispersal of funds because we'd have all the information that we need and not need to track that down once you are, are granted it. Um, I would at least encourage you to look at what that form is like and, and get a sense of what we're asking for in order to, to give you that funding. And the applications, um, you can apply online um, in a system called InfoReady. We have a link to this from our website. We also have a link. You also can Google it. If you Google University of Wyoming Info Ready, you'll come up with a page of our internal system in the University of Wyoming um, where you can look for adapting to climate change and find it that way. I think it will probably be simpler for everyone just to go through our website and click the apply now button and you'll be able to, to get right in and apply for the grant. Um, next slide. Okay, so, and we also have a few requirements of grantees. So let's say you are selected for funding and we are you know, pleased to give you funding for whatever project that you've um, talked about. You will need to leverage Western water assessment resources. So in your proposal, you have to discuss how you'll leverage or work with Western water assessment. And I wanna let you all know that on our website and maybe if one of the co-hosts would be willing to pop the website into the chat so that people can see that. Um, there is a, there is a um, supplemental material that you can download that has a list of all the resources that Western Water Assessment could provide. So you can look through those resources and think about how you might wanna leverage the resources that we have. We also wanted to keep reporting really simple and easy. Um, for this project because we realized that it's it's a fairly short term and it's not a ton of money. And so we wanted to make sure that it's not a huge hassle um, to report on what you've done. And so what we're hoping to do is have three meetings um, between West, our Western Water Assessment Team and your team during the course of the project. There will be a meeting very soon after you get awarded funding just to solidify our plan for working together um, talk with you about any other questions you might have about the project. Then midterm, instead of doing some sort of a midterm report, we'll also have another meeting with you in the middle of the project just to see how things are going and get a sense for how um, the project is going along. If you're having any challenges, um, answer any questions you might have in the middle of that. And then at the very end of the project, we will do a third meeting um, where we just kind of discuss your summary report and um, finalize aspects and um, check in with you one last time. We will have one very short report, just two to three pages at the end of the project. So those will be due July of 2025. If you finish it early, you can definitely submit it early. And um, then the final and last thing that is important to us is um, public outreach materials. And it can just be one element that you think is useful for your um, audience, community, whatever you're working with, um, that's a public facing deliverable to communicate what your project has accomplished. And this will be targeted at a general audience and there's lots of different formats that we'd be willing to have you do that in. But we wanna be able to share these as inspiration for other communities and other stakeholder groups about what they might want to do. And so we will ask for one type of public outreach material that you'll develop, and then we'll um, post that on our website as well. Next slide. All right, so that is all of um, the, the official information of the webinar. Um, I know that I think Benet just put the website um, into the chat, so you shall have access to that, but it's also here. I would say the website is probably the best place to get information about the project. It has all of the supplemental materials in it. 
You can also scan this QR code and go to the website. Um, while you can search for University of Wyoming Info Ready and find it that way, if you go through the link from our website, it's just an apply here button and it will take you directly into the system to apply. Um, it's an online system that will collect all of your materials. So it will ask you questions and then it will ask you to upload documents um, and then they'll be officially in the system. And with that, I think that we will move to our question and answer period. And we'd really love to hear from all of you about what you're curious about and what additional questions you have. And so please, I noticed that there is um, one question coming up in the Q&A, but please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A and we will um, get to as many of those as we can. All right, thank you, Corey. Let me uh, switch the view here one second. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for those of you who have already uh, asked questions so far. Um, are you ready for me to open it up, Corey? Sure, that's great, Ethan. Okay. Um, so the first question I have here, do you anticipate that the three meetings will be in person at WWA or, or Zoom? and Western Water Assessment, sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited about learning what Western Water Assessment uh, resources are that on the one hand that I would want to build in the meetings at Western Water Assessment. But on the other hand, Zoom doesn't require travel. So. Absolutely, and we wanna work with you in whatever is convenient for you. And so um, I, think that, I think that our default will probably be to use Zoom um, just because given the spread of the various folks that are in Western Water Assessment, um, we are all around. I would love if there are opportunities for me to come to you for those meetings um, and then to maybe zoom in our other Western Water Assessment folks, that would be an option as well. So I think that we'll work with you to figure out what the best um, way to do that is. I think default, we'll do Zoom. And then if it works for me to travel to you, I'd be happy to do that. If you're close to Laramie, I'd love um, to meet you in Laramie as well, but we'll work with you to see what works for you. Great. Um, so the next question is, uh, Corey mentioned that the grant was for rural and indigenous <laughs> communities and not urban centers. What do you qualify as urban centers versus rural communities? This is a really, really great question. And this is a great question for Wyoming because I think that most of our communities in Wyoming would um, qualify as rural, um, you know, in terms of um, serving populations that are, um, you know, spread out and spread out across the landscape. And so I would think that for most communities in Wyoming, unless you're working like Justin Casper or Justin Cheyenne, um, you're going to be fine. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts from Katie or Benet on that? I would just add that we will be releasing information for office hours for like really specific questions. So, you know, if if someone was concerned about whether their project would qualify um, into this consideration, they are welcome to reach out directly, either email Corey directly with the email address on the website or I mean on the slide that's showing or sign up for office hours with us and we can chat with you more because we'd love to chat with folks um, to help make things as efficient as possible for everybody. Great. <laughs> um, the next question, can you share some examples of ways you would like to see applicants leverage Western water assessment resources? What might that look like? And I might, just because, um, Benet, you know the bigger picture of all of the um, Western water assessment resources. Would you mind taking this one? Absolutely. Yeah. So I would encourage folks to download the um, service areas, we called it handout, which does give some examples for each of those categories that Ethan showed in um, his presentation. Um, but I think what I will, what's easy to share kind of just more generally is that um, we have a really interdisciplinary team at Western Water Assessment with folks who are experts in hydrology, climate science, um, climate assessment, social scientists. Um, we have just kind of folks 
across the spectrum. And so um, we have a, a wide range of expertise. Um, and we also have online tools that we are that we can easily build for folks. Um, so maybe just like a couple examples. Um, we could help folks um collect the latest, best reputable science on climate impacts for your community um, or uh, expected future conditions for your community. We can help convene workshops and meetings. We can help communities think through vulnerabilities or um, brainstorm adaptation strategies. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, we can easily build some online tools for pulling in existing data. Um, we can help folks better understand tools and data um, because we know there's a lot out there. So it's a really, it's a wide range. Um, and so, yeah, that handout, we have the service areas handout is, um, might be helpful for kind of digging into that in more specifics. And again, folks would be welcome to reach out if you didn't see a particular service listed, but you wondered if it's something we could help with, feel free to, to reach out and we can chat about that. Great, thanks, Vinny. Um, next one is, are only grantees able to use Western Water Assessment Services? If our project is not funded, can we still use your technical support? We want to work with everybody, I'll say. So, um, you know, Western Water Assessment is here to support communities across Wyoming and Colorado and Utah. And so um, if you're a community and you see in our list of services something that you could really use help with, please feel free to reach out. We have a full-time staff team that is kind of devoted to building relationships with communities and resource managers and thinking about how we can be most useful um, to support building resilience in the region. So yeah, please um, always feel free to reach out to us, whether it's um, through this funding opportunity or just beyond. Okay. Yeah, and the one thing that I'd add to that is I think we're really excited to build relationships in Wyoming. So I am at the University of Wyoming and I only came in 2019 right before COVID hit, but um, I think we see the potential for a lot of a lot of growth and a lot of partnership in Wyoming. And we really, one of the reasons that we went for this supplemental addition um, to the grant proposal is because we want to build relationships. And so I think, you know, we'd love, we'd love to work with you. And um, I just ditto what, what Vinay said. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Next one is, uh, where can we sign up for those Western Water Assessment Office hours? So we will early next week um, get a link up on our website. So I would I would say like keep our website bookmarked um, or check back on it next week. And, and we should have a sign up for that there. Um, I think that it's also possible for us to send an email to all of you who attended and um, give you that information as well directly. All right. Um, next one. Does this project funding pay for planning and design of a restoration site? Yeah, I think that if if you can frame this sort of a project as um, resilience building and um, response adaptation or response to climate change, I think that that could fall under the applied adaptation projects. Any thoughts from Katie or Benet on that too? All right, um, next one. Would this funding be available for infrastructure, like improving metering or monitoring groundwater levels? I think that things like um, metering and monitoring are really important for understanding our systems and how climate change is impacting them. So I would, I would say the same thing there. I think um, that that would be a very helpful project to expand our knowledge of, of the systems and how they're changing. Right. Um, what exactly would be a qualified project in an incorporated area, um, i.e. replace water lines that freeze or rural wastewater district pipeline infrastructure? So it would, I think I'm, I'm not totally sure how to answer this because I think that if, if the project would be in some way adapting to changes or shifts that you're seeing, 
because of climate change that are impacting your community, then I think that those things would be a qualified project. Um, I know in Laramie, uh, we're so cold that there's a possibility of water lines freezing all the time, and um, it may not be directly related to climate change necessarily. So I think that you just have to make the, the argument and, and make sure that you couch what you're looking for in terms of changes or shifts that you're seeing in that system. Um, any other thoughts on that one? I might just add, yeah, you know, I think um, our goal is to build climate resilience and that can be done in a lot of ways. And I see some, a lot of really great examples of like concrete things. There might be something about hosting a community meeting in a really rural unincorporated area that has high fire risk or wooey to think about dispensable space, community action, particularly, you know, we know unincorporated areas often struggle because they don't have a municipal government, right? They have less resources. You might be reliant on like volunteer wildfire protection. I'm just, you know, um, spitballing here, but that would be another example. So I think some of these concrete things like doing insulation, weatherizing or something like that, or, you know, um, replacing lines, but also some of this more capacity building, doing connections, helping communities, assessing how threats are and coming up with a plan, things like that. Um, and I think, you know, in that case, I, I think there could be a number of arguments that in an unincorporated area is highly vulnerable because it lacks that kind of government structure. Obviously, I think also incorporated towns that are rural or tribal or would be great fits too. But um, that's just to kind of give a breadth of, you know, I think concrete actions could be really helpful, but there also might be, um, you know, this convening or bringing people together to help respond to an issue where you don't know what to do, or you don't know how the issue is affecting folks or to kind of start new steps on something. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And I would only add that this, this funding opportunity was intentionally designed to be broad and flexible so that we can try to help support communities and groups where they're at and with what you, what you need. And it can be a little more experimental than perhaps some funding opportunities are where they're looking for infrastructure projects specifically or things like that. Um, but instead, as Katie alluded to and as Corey alluded to, this is we are we're keeping it pretty broad because there are a lot of um, different activities that often are difficult to secure support to do um, that would really um, help move communities forward and groups forward as they're trying to build resilience. Um, but that you know they require some funding and it's just it's hard to it's hard to get so. And we know you all are the experts of the issues facing your own communities much more than us. It's just, you know, what we just ask is you make a good case or explain to us um, because we might not have that local context of why this is important for your community um, and how this solves an issue. So I think, again, as Benet said, we wanted to keep it flexible because we know context matters. These issues look different in different places. And um, yeah, that's just let us know why and how the idea you have really um, fits the spirit of this and these qualifications. All right. Uh, um, next one is, will there be additional funding cycles with this grant money? And I'll, I'll give a answer and then I'd like to hear Vinay's answer as well. Um, I would love for there to be additional funding cycles with this grant money. So the um, the way that we apply for funding for the Western Water Assessment through NOAA is that there's um, every five years we apply for new money and there's the possibility when we do that to ask for this supplemental small grant award and I would love to continue to do that in the future. That's not um, super regular because it would probably happen once every five years um, and I personally would love to find ways and resources to make it happen more often for Wyoming because I, I do think that there's a lot of a lot of needs that could be met with a small um, grant fund like this. Other thoughts, Benet? Um, no, I think that's a great answer, Corey. I think, you know, um, 
this is uh, a new initiative that um, our funders are offering across, I think, a total of six um, climate adaptation partnerships teams across the country. So Western Water Assessment is just one of those. And I think if it goes well, um, and if communities that um, benefit from this funding reach out to NOAA, the agency, um, in the future, um, a case could be made that they would hopefully continue this maybe even sooner than every five years. So um, we'll keep our fingers crossed. But unfortunately, there isn't another cycle already baked into our funding stream um, for the for this year and the next few years. Um, but we'll definitely keep looking for opportunities to do work like this in the future. All right. Um. Can costs for community engagement that increase reach to more vulnerable communities, such as translation services or transportation support, be included in the funding? I would say absolutely yes, um, Tanya. I would. I, I think that we would really appreciate that as as something that you're trying to do with your work. And one of the real goals and intentions of this fund is to be able to provide services. Um, for communities that are underserved, you know, whether they're rural communities throughout Wyoming that often don't have access to the same amount of resources as some urban centers um, or tribal communities or other marginalized communities. So I think that those things would, would definitely be things that we would support being in your budget. Great. Uh, this one says, would a demonstration garden be an acceptable option? giving the community real examples of native water-wise plantings and ideas to help move away from turf grass and affect reducing our potable water usage and landscapes across our community. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that that, I think that um, there, like, like Benet said earlier, we purposefully made this call fairly broad because we want to hear from community members about what they think our, our applied solutions in their communities. So I think something like this would definitely fit. And um, part of what you'd wanna do is just make sure that you sort of um, describe that in a way that it shows like how that could um, increase the use of that garden or, or that gardening strategy um, for, a larger, for a larger audience, so. Yeah, I think that's a really exciting idea. And you know, you can say like, something like we would have, like, yeah, how you would um, encourage that adoption. Maybe it's like doing a field trips for communities or, um, you know, thinking about ways that that would um, support and grow that. And, you know, just being sure that, I think for all of us, we can tell that there's a climate link, but I just encourage folks to be explicit. Like, you know, if you're writing a grant and climate isn't in there at all, you know, we, of course, no climate affects lots of things, but that's just a good like maybe rule of thumb to make sure you have at least one sentence that explains the direct link to climate in this too. Great. All right. Um, can you give us a few ideas about possible projects that you would be excited to fund? I think we've talked about some and I, I feel like there's so many and it really is varied depending on what um, communities are excited to do and where the need is in your community. Um, you know, I think that one thing that I'd be really excited about is, um, you know, educational opportunities um, with youth around the state to really understand sort of their perceptions of climate change and, and where they think you know, there might be productive activity. So, so there could be a youth component. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's just such a number of things that could happen. It could be for planning for communities to think about um, various vulnerabilities that they might have to hazards and how they might respond to those. So it could be more of a um, vulnerability assessment and planning thing. Um, it could definitely be you know, specific on the ground projects, um, you know, uh, maybe helping to fund uh, alternatives to water hauling, you know, um, solar wells, things like that, that help with distribution of cattle with maybe 
some kind of a field trip involved to, to share that technology or that um, adaptation um, action with others. Uh, I'll, I'll open it up to Vinay and Katie if you guys have some suggestions as well. I think, you know, again, this is like, it's definitely a good chunk of money, but it's, we recognize it's also not enough to say, you know, like totally retrofit a whole town for something, yeah. right? But um, something that I think this doesn't need to be, but would be a cool thing is if there's a way that, you know, a process needs like one concrete item that then would allow a group to take additional steps, right? Like that this might be something that we fund, but that there might be follow-up impacts that will continue in the community rather than a one-off, like something like that to me that might um, be a catalyst for this. Um, I also think really, you know, thinking about um, a little bit of equity, you know, if it was like going to second home, um, you know, McMansions as a way to, like that might feel less uh, um, super, you know, maybe they're using a ton of resources and that would help the community, but I think finding ways for this funding to help folks that um, with these kind of adaptation resilience that might struggle to do so would be another compelling point. I mean, I totally agree with all the ones Corey said. Um, I'm excited to just see the diversity and range that will come through, but. And I just add um, that in the um, the funding, in the RFP, <laughs> I was like, what are the words? In the RFP um, on the, the website for this funding opportunity, and we've got the link to that website in the chat. Um, in that, it's a two-page PDF, and there's, you know, a little list of kind of general ideas, like understanding perceptions and risk, bringing community partners together, um, assessing vulnerability, adapting to changes, um, extending existing programs. And so those are just kind of like flavors of the broad umbrella that we would love projects to, to fall within, but it is like an enormous umbrella. So if, if you have an idea and you feel like, gosh, it might even not fit under this umbrella, again, feel free to reach out for office hours or send us an email. Um, and we could certainly have a conversation, um, before you spend a lot of time on um, on your five page proposal. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, which is you could come to us with like, here's three ideas we kind of thought of and we could, you know, this isn't meant to be a black box where you have to put together a lot of time, submit it and have no clue. Like we want you to be successful. We want to, you know, give ideas, help say that might be more confusing or that one seems like it would really fit. Like that's the kind of, you know, feedback we'd love to give in office hours. Um, so you could, you know, come with a few ideas or you could come with one idea that you have some key decisions and we could help workshop or give some input. Um, I think that that would be a really strategic and efficient way to use time. Great, all right. Um, it looks like this is the last question. Um, Corey, I think you partially answered it, but is it possible to use this funding to expand existing educational opportunities? Yeah, I, I think it definitely is. And especially if you're um, expanding them to new audiences or bringing in um, new types of folks for that existing educational program, um, expanding the scope of it in some way. Um, I think that all of those things would be things that um, if, if they're related to building resilience or um, adaptation in some way, I think those would be great. All right. All great. right. Well, I want to give just like a moment or two in case anyone has a last question that they want to throw in the chat. Um, but while we're giving it a moment or two, I also want to say that um, please visit the website. We will post this recording um, early next week on the website. Um, we'll also post information about how to sign up for office hours if you want to run some ideas by one or more of us. Um, we really do want this to be a, a funding source that serves you and your communities and allows you to do good work on the ground. And so um, we want to make it um, as easy and transparent for you as possible. My um, contact information is right there. Feel free to send me an email if you have a specific question about the project. 
Um, and, and another thing that I wanted to mention is that we also don't want this um, small grant competition to be a black box in the sense of like you put something in and then you're told, no, you didn't get funding and you don't get any feedback. So we are planning to give feedback to, to proposers one way or the other and kind of let you know um, what we liked and um, what could be improved in the future. So we will plan to do that. If you, if you submit something, you're gonna get some sort of feedback back so that you could improve that for the future. Um, and seeing no other questions popping in, um, I might thank you all for your time and uh, giving us 45 minutes of your lunch to learn about this grant opportunity. Please also share it with other community partners that you think might be interested in it. We really wanna get as many, um, as many proposals as we can so that we have a really competitive pool. And um, yeah, so we appreciate your help with that. Any other final words from anyone or? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. We appreciate you.